Essex Gospel. Welcome to uh, church this morning. Uh, let me pray with you as one of your pastors before we get started. I trust that you've been having a good week and enjoying some good weather. Uh, let's just have a time of prayer before we get started. Dear Lord, we look to you as our guide through every moment, through every trial, temptation, tragedy, through every celebration, through every joyful moment. We just seek you to guide us through every single one of those moments, Lord. Thank you so much for the strength that you give us to face every moment in front of us. Lord, we praise you and all honor all these songs to you. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. There's a song that cannot be contained There's a shout that breaks through every chain God, we won't be silent And there's a faith that rises through the flames There's a joy that chases the dark away God, we won't be silent Greater the storm Greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious. There's a faith that rises through the flames. There's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. The greater the storm, come on, church. The greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices. Make your praise so glorious, glorious. Lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices, make your praise so glorious. We we'll never stop singing. You give a light, you are 
song let's sing it together through every battle through every heartbreak through every circumstance oh I believe that you are my fortress you are my portion 
You are my hiding place Oh, I believe that you are the Joy, my. 
Good morning, Saints. It's good to be with you uh, this Sunday morning, August uh, the 2nd. As I mentioned last week, July was just about through, and uh, here we are. It's the first week of August. Well, the first couple of days of August, at least. And uh, again, just trusting that you're having a good summer. Uh, I want to remind you that it's Communion Sunday today. And so uh, make sure uh, by the end of the message that you have uh, your juice and your bread ready to go so that we can participate uh, in that uh, together. I'm hoping that this is the second last time that we will do communion separately, uh, August, and then maybe another one in September. Uh, but in October, I'm hoping, I have no guarantees, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to do communion uh, together safely uh, in the new sanctuary. And so I'm looking forward to that, and I trust that you are too. Uh, just a reminder that the building program is going well. We continue to make good progress. Very grateful uh, for that. Uh, very grateful for the building committee and the board and all of the hours that they have put into this and then a number of other volunteers that have uh, you know, uh, given us their time and their energy and their expertise and have put in countless hours as well. So it is a large team of people that I am very grateful to and I want you to know that I appreciate each and every one of them. I also want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in your giving. I really haven't said a whole lot about uh, our donations um, through the summer. They have been uh, very good and they've been very steady, uh, you know, since that interruption uh, back in March. I appreciate those of you uh, learning to do these things through e-transfers or payee. Uh, some of you have opted to do uh, pre-authorized remittance or PAR as we say it. And then some of you continue just to, you know, send us in uh, your checks and in the mail and we get those and I pass them on uh, uh, to Lynn, our, our bookkeeper. So I'm just grateful to everybody for their faithfulness and I want to say thank you on behalf of the leadership team. Um, it has been an interesting, you know, late, uh, what should I say, I guess uh, late winter, uh, spring and summer as it relates to church family uh, dynamics, getting together, and of course, uh, even our, our donations, right? We feel like maybe we're giving, you know, to an entity that we don't see a lot, but I hope that's not the way you feel, that we realize that we are a family and that uh, we're in a moment, uh, but we're going to work through the moment and, and God is going to do something new and something different, and we have to be prepared for that. We are working on the reopening plan, as I've mentioned to you, about making it safer when everybody comes back. You should be aware too that um, it will likely be a, a slow climb up a hill. It will be incremental. Uh, we will be adding pieces to ministry as you know the conditions on the ground, so to speak, allow us to do so. I am very aware that um, 
you know, that different people have different attitudes and responses to what's going on as it relates to the pandemic and whether or not they feel comfortable with human engagement and activity. So I'm aware of some of that. We are going to be putting out a survey, uh, especially for our volunteers, just to get uh, an idea of what they're thinking about, uh, you know, their particular area of ministry and uh, what they would need to hear and see in order to feel comfortable uh, to participate again. And uh, so there are all kinds of things that even when we're back in the building and we're starting uh, to ramp up ministry again, that we'll have to do that slowly, carefully, thoughtfully. And uh, there may be some things that we begin with and some things that we add later, or maybe some things that we just do differently, or perhaps even not at all for a while. But uh, we will do our best to keep you informed. But I want you to be thinking about that, that the return will not be as it was that there will be adjustments made and so that you should be aware of that. And um, just be prayerful about that and pray for our province, pray for the country that things continue to do uh, better and that people are, are being responsible and taking care of themselves and respectful of others as well. Those would be good things for us as a church family. Lots of other churches have already uh, started up. I've had conversations with a number of pastors from some of those churches. And uh, nothing looks too big or insurmountable, uh, but every church is different. Every church family is different. So we will be considerate of, of all of those things. So uh, let me pray for you and let me just pray for your family. Father, we just thank you that we're able to be uh, together again uh, through the broadcast. And I pray your blessing on each family, that you would encourage them physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. We know that these have been difficult times of isolation, and separation. We thank you that the Bible reminds us that we are one in the spirit, that we are a spiritual entity, not just a physical body, and that you are alive and well in each of us. And although we can't always be together, we are still one in Christ. And so encourage everybody, help all of us to continue to be steadfast in your word and always looking to Jesus who is the author and the finisher, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning. Good morning. Uh, good to be with you. I, I want to make a bold statement today. I want you to know that God is sovereign over all the events of this world, of all worlds, and in fact, of all creation itself. How do I know that? This is what the Bible says. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 11, that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. In Psalm 115 verse 3, our God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. Job 42 and 2. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. Daniel writes this. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? There is no one like our God. And our God is large and our God is in charge. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, we see the author, King Solomon, struggling with the randomness of life and perhaps failing to see the sovereignty of God in his life and in life as a whole. This is what Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 9, 11 to 12. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned. <coughs> Excuse me. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, 
or birds are taken in a snare. So people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Now, to understand the book of Ecclesiastes, I think it's best to say that the views of Solomon in this book don't always seem godly or even optimistic. There seems to be an edge to his sayings or his observations. Solomon will square all of this in chapter 12 with his conclusion of the matter. But through the first 11 chapters of Ecclesiastes, it seems like the writer is on an exercise to try to make sense of how things happen and then being frustrated that he can't make sense of things that are happening. Chapter 9 and verses 11 and 12 are samples of his struggle to understand. Maybe sometimes you feel that way as well. Solomon writes about people being trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. We feel like we're in the middle of that right now in Canada, in Ontario, in Essex and Windsor, in, in the summer months of 2020. What does Solomon say? And maybe you agree with him in some of these initial thoughts. He's noticed something under the sun, right? This is one of his expressions about being under the sun. Things don't always go as expected. Have you noticed that once in a while? That things don't always go as expected? That's his first observation. His second observation is that he feels that chance seems to dictate events. Things don't always go as expected, and chance seems to dictate events. The third thing that he notices is that uncertainty is the only certain thing. So things don't always seem to go as expected. Chance seems to dictate events. And uncertainty is the only certain thing. His views seem a little pessimistic and possibly downright gloomy. I'm not sure when he wrote this if he was having a bad day or life had just thrown him so many curves that he just doesn't know what to think anymore. Have you ever felt like that? Things don't go as expected. That there's too much randomness and lots of uncertainty. You find it difficult to be positive, hopeful, and faithful. Again, I think this, these verses speak exactly to our situation today. So let's dig into Solomon's observations and feelings to see if they can help us find God in our 2020 uncertain times. So as I mentioned earlier, Solomon feels this, that things don't always go as expected. Secondly, the chance seems to be the controlling factor in life. And third, that uncertainty is the one certain thing. So, number one, things don't go as expected. Solomon says this, the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong or food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned. The philosophical view, this is, is what Solomon has been noticing. First of all, we are operating here under the rules of Solomon or we might call them the laws of nature. Nature says this, the swift, the strong, the wise, the brilliant, and the learned should succeed and advance. That's what Solomon thinks should be. That's what the laws of nature seem to suggest. The weak die or suffer. And I don't think most of us would object to that kind of thinking to Solomon's kind of thinking, at least not initially, the race should be to the swift. The battle should be to the strong. Food should come to the wise. Wealth to the brilliant and favor to the learned. I mean, that's what we think should happen. That's the way things are ordered. That's the way we think that God has ordered them. But Solomon is saying that and saying, but that's not what I see. I don't see the race winning, uh, pardon me, the swift winning the race. I don't see the strong overcoming in battle. I don't see the wise or the brilliant or the learned, you know, uh, reaping the advantages of their studies and their wisdom. So what does Solomon see? 
Well, we have eight previous chapters of what he sees in the book of Ecclesiastes. But in general, Solomon sees that the laws of nature aren't always in force. Those that you bet on to win don't always win. There are surprises. The underdog wins a few. Sometimes the swiftest run runner stumbles. A physically weaker opponent outsmarts the stronger one. And smart people aren't always the most successful. Things don't always go as expected. Have you noticed that? Children, adults, marriages, leadership, investments, friendship, education can have redirection, failures, and unexpected circumstances. Now, just because things don't always go as expected doesn't mean that uh, everything is a disaster. Sometimes things don't go as expected, but turn out even better. There are serendipitous moments, things that happen to us that we didn't expect, but great things happen. We didn't plan for it. We didn't expect it, but something wonderful has landed in our lap. But Solomon here tends to have a bent towards the negative. He feels that things are somewhat out of control, that things don't always go as they should. The second thing he says is that chance seems to control life, that no one is in charge, least of all us. This viewpoint that things don't always go as planned helps Solomon to logically regress to the next point of his understanding. Chance seems to be the controlling factor of life, according to Solomon. No one really is in charge, as I said earlier, not you. And Solomon would appear to say even not God. Solomon writes this, but time and chance happen to them all. Time is limited, and I'll pick that up in point three. Time is limited, but chance is the governing law. But regarding chance, you can make plans you can bet on the likelihood of circumstances, but you will find that though it makes sense in your mind, things like this, one plus one equals two, you may find that doesn't always seem to be the case. You may have made your plans, thought things through logically, put safeguards in place, but chance sometimes seems to trump it all. It doesn't add up to two. As such, this affects your view of God and life. You might be a little bit like Solomon. God is not in charge. You most certainly aren't in charge. And chance seems to be. Chance seems to be the ruler of life. So adjust your life to being periodically surprised by chance's gifts to you. And also to his propensity to disappoint you more often than not. In Solomon's world, there is no order. There is no sense. There is just chance. As such, slow people win races. Weak people will overcome the strong at least once in a while. And smart people will end up on the streets. Who knows? Chance dictates. So this kind of thinking ultimately uh, leads to the devolving step. Next step for Solomon. Step number three, uncertainty rules. Nothing and no one is reliable. Your time is short or long. Well, your time is at best uncertain. Moreover, he says this, no one knows when their hour will come. He tells this story, as fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare. So people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. It is kind of a gloomy look, isn't it? It is kind of a, a pessimistic look. As fish are unexpectedly caught in a net, birds unknowingly trapped in a snare. People like fish and birds are, pardon the, the mixed metaphor here, people like fish and birds are trapped in the same boat, trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. Our life is no better than fish or birds. Interesting equivalent. Life is uncertain. Like a fish minding its own business in the water or a bird that lands to feed or to build a nest. Boom! They are caught or trapped 
in evil times. It was good and peaceful, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't. Does it remind you of March 2020? Or maybe it's got nothing to do with the pandemic and what we've been going through these last number of months. Maybe it's, it's something in your home. Maybe it's something at work. I mean, folks, it could be so many things that it just seemed like you were sailing along. Everything was good. God was in charge or you were in charge, but things were going well. And then all of a sudden, like a fish caught in an evil net or a bird trapped in a snare, everything has changed. This is what Solomon seems, that life is just so random and so unexpected. And at one moment, it can be good. And in the next moment, it can be gone. We would agree to some extent life is uncertain. There are times when we have seen that everything seems to be moving along just fine. And then as the expression goes, the bottom falls out. And then we either say to ourselves or to someone that we love, who saw that coming? I didn't see that coming. Did you see that coming? What do we do now? And then when you reflect on your bed at night, when your head's on your pillow, you say, how did this happen? And we start thinking like Solomon, where there's uncertainty and chance and randomness. We are left alone to react to adjust and hopefully repair. We're, we're on our own. We do our best. Life is bigger than us, and the events of this uncertain universe don't care if Solomon gets trapped in the unpredictably, unpredictability of the cosmos or if we do as well. Life is good. Life is bad. Scoop up the good when you can and endure the bad when you have to. Good or bad may last a short time or a long time, those who should succeed because they put in the hard work don't always. Sometimes less than smart, gifted, or hardworking people get further ahead. It doesn't make sense, but it seems to happen. Life is just so random. It's not that we want necessarily sameness or predictability, but we have a sense of logic and order that this should add to that, those that put in the work or have got the brains should succeed. And when the rules don't seem to apply, we begin to wonder about life and who's in charge and what does it all mean. So that's all a wow. Solomon's given us a lot to think about. How do you feel about all that right now as you're listening this morning? I think we can find points of agreement with Solomon when we say that life doesn't always seem to make sense, that it doesn't always fall in the order, that those who should be blessed are blessed, and that those who are doing evil should, you know, suffer the consequences. Good, good things happen to bad people. And bad things happen to good people. And there's just parts of that that just don't seem to make sense. And when everything was sailing along just smoothly and we were minding our own business and it seemed like we were getting ahead and life was good, the bottom is out from underneath us. So it all seems kind of pessimistic, right? None of that seems really good. It just seems like Everything is out of control. Everything is random. Everything is unpredictable. There is no law. There is no order. But let me give you a biblical retort to that. It's true. Things don't always go as expected. Solomon mentions that. You know what? The race doesn't always go to the swift. That's fine. Things don't always go expected. You don't have to be too long on this earth to recognize that, that things don't always go as expected. The good news is that sometimes when we think things are going to go poorly, they go well. This is, this is personal, but I think it's important for me to share it. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, you know, my daughter uh, thought that she had, had, had miscarried. And we were, we were going to the hospital, uh, you know, for an ultrasound. Basically, what I thought was to confirm 
the loss of a child. And um, so her spouse couldn't make it, you know, job stuff. My wife couldn't make it. Don't remember the reason. So dad went with his daughter. Now that in itself seems, seems pretty unusual. So I'm going with my daughter. We don't know for a fact, but we think that she's, she's perhaps miscarried. And I'm sitting in the waiting room, right? You know, a dumb dad. You know, probably the last person in the world that you would want in the waiting room. But I'm, I'm there with my daughter. I'm going to be a, the support. I'm thinking I'm going to be the guy uh, giving the consolation, giving the hugs and kisses when she comes out. And it's confirmed that she's lost the baby. And then the technician comes in and says to me, do you want to come in and look? And I'm... Like, it, it didn't occur to me in that moment that there was good news. I was sitting there thinking that there's likely going to be bad news. And all of a sudden, in a wonderful way, things didn't go as expected. And so there are some things in life that don't go expected as expected, and they're negative. And then there's wonderful moments like this where you think it's going to be a negative, and God turns it into a positive. So don't be rattled by the fact that... that Things don't always go as expected. You don't have to be a negative Nellie. And Nellie Dam and, and Nellie Wilms, I'm, I'm sorry. You don't have to be a negative Nellie to understand this. We've all lived long enough to know that things don't always work out. We, we know the expression, right? The best laid plans of, of men and mice, of people and mice. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily a negative thing. And it doesn't necessarily mean that God's not in control. God is not sovereign. God is not in charge. But let me carry through the argument. Things don't always go as expected. That's true. The problem is this, is we make plans and then we hope God will ratify the plans. You know, but the steps of a righteous person are order of the Lord. And there is a way that seems right, you know, to a person, but, you know, the end of it all is, is up to God. So, you know, God knows what's going on. God, God is sovereign over all situations. Bottom line is we as Christ followers need to get in tune with what God is doing, what God is saying, and then we would be less likely to, you know, to be disappointed by things or for hoping for, praying for, believing for things that God says, no, that's not for you right now. And that there are some curveballs in life. Things don't always go as expected, but God's still in charge. Don't let the moments, don't let the moments um, determine your whole life and, and where it's going and how it's going to end up. Secondly, does chance control life? That's false. Things don't always go as expected. That's true. Chance controls life. That's false. Although there does seem to be overwhelming evidence that chance is in charge, she is not. Solomon feels the chance is in charge, right? I mean, unexpected times. The bottom falls out. We're motoring along and everything seems good. And then all of a sudden it isn't. So you know what? Things happen. Uh, life happens is the expression that people used in the last little while. And that's true. But, the, but that doesn't mean that chance is in charge. God is still in charge, but life is not predictable. Life is not always easy. Life is not without trials and tribulations. Our faith will be tested. Circumstances are beyond our control, but chance is not in charge. And third, and finally, that uncertainty governs all events. The clock runs out on us, or it doesn't seem to. Fish get caught in the net. Birds get trapped in the snare. And sometimes we feel like we're those fish in the net or the birds in the snare. That we've not lived long enough or that we've overstayed our welcome. Solomon says this. It does feel like sometimes that people are trapped by evil times. You are born into a time or a season where evil happens, that they fall unexpectedly on them, right? Again, if I can reference the pandemic, everything was seemingly good in January, February 2020. And then by about the middle of March 2020, we seem to be trapped by evil times that fell unexpectedly on us. Now, maybe some of the scientists knew something was coming. Maybe some of the politicians knew something was coming. 
But for the average Joe and the average Jill, we had no idea. Bam, here we are in a pandemic. Job losses, mounting government and personal debt, illness, lockdowns, schools closed, people isolated, division. We feel trapped by our unexpected and evil times. But God has an answer to this so that we don't despair. Let me remind you what I stated earlier at the beginning of the sermon. Now, I thought about this. I thought about digging into some other verses that remind us that God is sovereign and in charge. And I thought, no, Brent, just stick with what you already said. Let me remind you what I said at the beginning. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. God works all things, not just some things, but all things to the counsel of his will. God is in charge, not chance. God is dictating events. God is working through human events. God will demonstrate, even in the midst of some of our messes, his grace and his love and his mercy. Our God is in the heavens and he does as, does as he pleases. Absolutely. God is in charge. Nobody tells God what to do. God does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And what he has for you and I is blessing. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. People can plot against God. And in fact, the prophets talk about this. You can plot against God, but you can never win. You can devise a, a, a plan against God, but you can never win. Nothing that God determines can be thwarted. But let me add one that I didn't have at the beginning. One that is very familiar to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, because I don't think there's a verse, at least in the New Testament, that says it better than this. And we know, and we know, and we know, not I think I know, or I should know, or I'm finding out, and we know that all things, all things, not some things or a few things, and we know that all things work together for good. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, that's us. To them who are called according to his purpose, that's us. Folks, we are in difficult times, evil times. We, we recognize that. Um, these are not easy days. And they have fallen unexpectedly on us. But... God's got a purpose for this generation in these days. Just as he had a purpose for the generations in the past, whether it was during World War I or the Great Depression or World War II or, or whatever time period that you want to talk about, God always has a generation for each period of time in history. And especially when they're evil times and it seems like they have fallen unexpectedly upon us. God will always raise up a generation that will be able to match and exceed and succeed in the difficult times in which we're in. And so there's no question that these are challenging days, but, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, even in the middle of a pandemic, even in 2020. God is in charge God has equipped you, God has blessed you, God is working for your good, and although it appears from time to time that there's no certainty, that there's way too much randomness, that chance has way too much control, that is not the way it is. It is the way God says it is. God is the controlling factor in our lives. God is in charge. Nothing happens without his knowledge and without it being a part of his plan for your life and for my life. It doesn't mean that everything that happens to us is pleasant, but God is working out his purposes for your life. Your journey must recognize that God is sovereign and it must also recognize that living victoriously requires some faith on your part. God is working his purposes for our good. Bad things happen and are happening. Trust God, show some trust, and show some faith in him. Because you are not a fish caught in a net. You are not a bird trapped in a snare. Chance is not your God. And even in uncertain times, there is 
the certainty of a loving God who is watching out for you. Before we have communion, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for those who find themselves in difficult times and challenging times where they have been feeling like giving up or quitting, that uncertainty and chance and randomness and evil times that have fallen on them seem to be the controlling influence in their thoughts and their minds. Remind them of what a big God you are. Remind them through your word that nothing happens without your knowledge and that no one can thwart your plans, that you are on their side. And when you are on their side, they will always be on the winning side. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I trust that that was an encouragement to you this morning, an encouragement to us as we think about uh, the communion table. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping that this is just the second last time that we have to do this uh, separately through a camera. Uh, but nonetheless, it is just as important for us to remind ourselves that we are part of one family, not just Essex Gospel, but the family of God. And we remind ourselves that Jesus is the bread of life and that he has given his life for us that we might live again. So when we partake of the bread, participate in the bread, let's remember Jesus who is the bread of life, who feeds us and nurtures us. Let's participate together. And then we look to the cup, to the new covenant in his blood. We are so grateful for a new covenant in his blood that moves us away from works of the law uh, to the life of the spirit and through the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from each and every stain and the very great and precious promises that remind us that he is coming again for you and for me. He's coming again for his church and that there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the evil times in which we live, the unexpected evil times, the, the circumstances of our days will be in the past when we will finally be in and be with perfection in Christ. And so we thank him for that. Let's partake of the, the cup together, remembering his shed blood. Father, we thank you for the bread that reminds us of the life of Christ and for the juice that reminds us of the new covenant in his blood shed for us so that we might know the forgiveness of sins. And I pray, Father, for those that may be watching today that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that may be feeling overwhelmed by the circumstances of this life. They may be feeling like a victim, that things are out of their control, that they can be reminded today to look to the sovereign God, to look to his son who died on the cross for, for them, and that they would put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ to know the forgiveness of sins and to know the promise of an eternity forever with him. I pray that they will put their trust and their faith in Jesus today. In his name, amen.